Ayo Iwana, Ayo Iwana Doba, who's watching guys on screen. Welcome to our third world here at the Tonight, I'm very happy to introduce you, Lalu, Rokhip, uh, co-founder of Life Labs, and also Bitcoin Engineer. Uh, why new network should be a new topic for you, since we had a wonderful presentation on February uh, by Christian Decker. And speaking of uh, Christian, Christian is here again, yay, from Zurich. And also we have the pleasure to have uh, Pierre and Fabrice from uh, uh, Paris. They are working on Eclair, they are asking the eyes. And I mean, the interoperability between uh, the project is uh, something that uh, we really believe in. We are very proud to contribute and facilitate it. Um, between all these amazing uh, implementation. Um, this is the only way uh, we believe that uh, Bit Bitcoin could be uh, more scalable and uh, more safe, um, safer and also stronger. So Lightning is already working very well on Testnet two months ago at the Pub Room 77, which is one of the oldest places accepting Bitcoin in Berlin. The Owen proposer to give a free beer to everyone who found out how to send him a lightning uh, transaction with his net coins, and Lalo has been the first to pay and enjoying a beer with lightning. So, lightning is possible even without SegWit, but with SegWit all this magic it could be happen very easily and very soon. And it's happening right now with Litecoin, for example, just for saying. So, let's make Bitcoin great again. Um, the reference in my hat. So about the talk, I should say something first. Lalu is very famous for his uh, lightning pace of talking, which is uh, famous and epic too. But tonight I ask him uh, and he promised me, yeah. yeah, okay, that he will talk slower than usual. Okay, deal? Yeah, deal. Deal, okay. <laughs> It will give an over etching talk on the history, the present state, and the future aspiration of Lightning. I don't want to say anything more because, uh, yes, um, because you will talk about everything. After the talk, there will be time for uh, questions from you, everything you want to ask Lalo, and also if you want to ask something from Giacomo, and also if you want to come here and just say hi. That's uh, your turn. Okay, now it's time for Lalo. Hey, so I'm going to kind of give like a talk uh, first, a little bit about the history of Lightning, how it started out at first. Um, you know, how uh, people came it came about to be, exactly what it, it aims to solve, kind of the current state of the implementation, meaning who's working on it, how far are we, what the specifications look like. And then finally, some later stuff that um, goes into you know what it can be used for, and uh, what do some newer you know execution modes for Lightning itself look like? So uh, first we'll start. Oh, wait, wait. oh, oh, oh. oh. Huh? Huh? okay. Huh? Oh, maybe the foot on the. Oh, that. Okay. Cool. cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, first we'll. Is that my direction? Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, it's right. All right. No, no, no. <laughs> you cannot look at it. I can't look at it. Tina? <laughs> uh, let's begin. Okay. Rotation? No. Nope. Rotation? <laughs> Ooh, very strange, yeah. I'm standing on the side. I can talk like louder. Is this good? No. No, no. no because yeah. now it's... Oh, it's off now. It's off. It's off. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is that? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, okay, oh perfect. it's working. Stand here. Yes. Then, but then, how can I do my slides? Yes, yeah, I can do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So first, we'll start with basically the way Bitcoin works today, right? So uh, as is right now, Bitcoin is a peer to peer network, right? So you basically have you know a bunch of full nodes, and you have the Bitcoin network itself, and the, the nodes in the network communicate with each other by passing messages around, right? And this means that everything oh cool is full broadcast. So if I were to pay uh, you know, Andrew here, basically I don't pay him directly as if I had cash. I just need to tell the entire network, hey, I'm about to pay Andrew. And as a result, every single participant is an observer to this payment itself. And they need to be an observer because they need to keep an up-to-date version of the Bitcoin blockchain itself. So as a result, um, there's kind of uh, you know, some drawbacks with this. 
Uh, because it's full broadcast, this means that every other participant needs to talk to everybody else. And uh, you know, if you know a little bit about like networking and communication, this obviously isn't very scalable. Because uh, if everyone's receiving every single transaction, then as the network grows, you know, in number of participants and the volume itself doesn't scale well because the load of, on each network keeps increasing, and as a result, it's not very uh, robust. Um, additionally, uh, every single participant, even if they're not involved in the payment, needs to be involved in this process of broadcasting the transaction. Which means that even though I'm paying Andrew, you know, everyone else in the world knows that I'm making a particular payment. Maybe they don't know it's to Andrew because uh, you know we have these Bitcoin addresses, but that still is very inefficient and also sacrifices sacrifices its degree of privacy. And then finally, uh, every single payment that's ever been made is now timestamped in the blockchain for all time. And uh, you know initially this wasn't a big problem. You know the chain was like a gigabyte, you know ten gigabytes. I think now it's maybe like 150 gigabytes or so with all the indexes. And uh, you know this also just shows you that it can be very scalable. And also uh, this means that every single transaction is there for all time which means you have virtually zero privacy because anyone can go back in the transaction log or the graph and then see you know, who paid who and maybe with some extra information outside of the system can then try to kind of like ascertain exactly um, you know, what happened in the past. Um, so this is kind of like some of the limitations and Lightning uh, you know, tries to solve most of this um, and we'll see a little bit in, uh, later on the talk exactly how it go about it and some of the trade-offs involved. So uh, why payment channels, right? So, um, like I was saying before, the on-chain transactions themselves, um, they have a few drawbacks, you know, so they're very good for large payments amounts, but uh, there's some issues with basically the user experience of using, you know, raw Bitcoin as is currently. Uh, so, for one thing, uh, the fees are pretty, like, unpredictable, right? So, you know, you pay a fee to the, to, uh, to the network, and it's up to the jobs of the miners to basically select transactions that have an adequate fee, but the question is, what is adequate? That's kind of hard to, um, you know, determine. And that also depends on the load of the network at the time, what software the miner is running, and many other um, uh, factors as well. Uh, additionally, the um, you know the block time is variable, meaning you don't really know how long it's going to take until your transaction is confirmed after you broadcast it. So uh, it kind of has like a random process. On average, it's 10 minutes, but um, it can be like an hour, you know, two or three hours with lower probability. So that kind of has like a weird experience, and you can get around that with something like you know zero confirmations. But those don't really have good security, and if that was secure, we basically wouldn't need Bitcoin at all. And uh, it's also it's, it's not instant, like I was saying. Uh, you know, you, you have to wait for the blocks, and it's also not very compatible with small payments because the small payments, uh, because you know, every transaction has a transaction fee, and you may get to the point where you know the transaction fee is greater than the payment itself, so the payment doesn't really make sense at all. So what uh, payment channels try to do is instead of doing all the transactions on chain, basically you know everything that's being broadcast to all the other participants, we instead do one on chain transaction, and then the rest of the correspondence is off chain, right? So you do a one time setup, and then everything else is off chain. And this lets us have you know, some desirable uh, uh, features. Uh, one of them is being that payments are actually instant, right? So when many people got to Bitcoin, they're usually they're like, oh, it's like you know, internet magic, internet cash, I can send money instantly. Uh, it was kind of like that, but I mean, as people went on and the load in the system increased, they realized that was not the true you know, uh, capability of the system. But Lightning, or payment channels in general, allow you for actually to have instant payments. So the setup may take some time, but afterwards payments are instant. Another cool factor about this is that the fees are actually predictable the way we've designed it, uh, something called source writing. So before you even make a payment, you could even display to the user it's going to cost you know five satoshis to send this payment, and that's better user experience because um, you know people have been seeing that uh, today wallets don't have great fee estimation, and users can be surprised about you know what th what fees they're paying, and it can also kind of be unintuitive because fees in Bitcoin are they basically skip the size of the transaction itself. And that's kind of like a very technical um, you know, uh, mechanism within the system, while uh, fees on Lightning, where we designed it today, scale with the number, with the size of the payment itself. So it's, all, it's pretty predictable. And the cool part is you can send very, very small amounts over Lightning. So with Bitcoin, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of like a ceiling where it would be uneconomical to send the payment. With Lightning, we can go uh, you know, down to like a hundred penny, thousandth penny. We can have like mil Satoshis, which are like a thousandth of a Satoshi, so we can really you know, continue to divide this down. And uh, you know, so one thing to note is that it's basically just not, you know, it's not a silver bullet like a panacea. Uh, it doesn't solve all the problems, and you you can't use it to completely completely replace all of the use cases. But you know, what it does do, we think it does it well, and therefore, you know, we can have both on-chain payments, or maybe very large payments, or if you're you know wiring like hundred thousand dollars to an exchange or whatever, and then uh, off-chain payments for smaller payments, I think that can be instant, and maybe we can have that kind of like a, a middle zone between the two. Uh, so you know, getting some use cases now. So uh, you know, the use cases uh, are you know, are pretty cool. They're pretty profound. And I think uh, uh, adding Lightning to Bitcoin the system itself kind of starts to fulfill some of the promises that people thought Bitcoin fulfilled before they understood the system very well. So you know, using this, we can start to create something that's uh, you know kind of like a global scale payment network itself. 
that in the base layer isn't very good for payments because of the um, uh, features I mentioned before, basically being unpredictability of the blocks and the transaction fees being unpredictable as well. But with Lightning, uh, we can kind of have something closer to credit cards because uh, the payments themselves are instant and they can have very low fees. Additionally, we can do basically instant micropayments, right? And uh, previously, micropayments were very possible on the internet uh, before, at least not in the decentralized setting, because you have to trust somebody, you know, to handle disputes, and the cost of dispute maybe uh, prohibit the actual cost of, of actual transaction because it would be un uneconomical for you know the underwriter or the person that's handling the disputes themselves. So with this, we can actually do programmatic micropayments, you know, which have many, uh, you know, cool applications like you know you can do like pay per second for music streaming or micropayments for articles or payroll or you know some gaming things. Uh, it just kind of creates like a very uh, like fluid conduit for you know payments over the internet, which haven't really existed before until you know Bitcoin type technologies. A um, uh, cool thing is also is exchange and integration or innovation with exchanges themselves. So as we've seen, you know, exchanges they're kind of like the on and off ramp between you know, cryptocurrencies, and as a result, there has been kind of like reintroducing the systematic risk into the system, which we you know sought to eliminate with Bitcoin itself. And you know, exchanges in the past they've been hacked many times, and they're just kind of like these very big targets for regulation. But with things like Lightning, we can kind of make these a little bit more decentralized. So with Lightning, the user themselves can actually hold their funds in kind of like a joint account with the exchange, meaning that we can start to restrict the um, set of uh, you know capabilities a hacker will actually get to the exchange can do. We can do instant uh, deposits on into and out of the exchanges, and then we can also do some very cool like order types between cross exchanges themselves. So you know there are a bunch of cool applications to Lightning itself, and we're really excited about this. And you know we'll get to this eventually, but we're still working on building a protocol itself. All right, so now kind of like walking through how did Lightning come about. This probably doesn't have everything on here, and maybe the dates aren't exactly correct, but you know, initially there were basically unidirectional payment channels. And this is a payment channel that goes in one direction. So you know, I open a payment channel with Andrew here, and then that, uh, when I open up the payment channel, I lock basically you know, 10 euros into that, right? And that means I can only ever, within the lifetime of the channel, send up to 10 euros. And this is basically a single transaction, and after that, the channel is set up. But once that channel has been set up, I can basically instantly send um, and that will be updated in the balance. So we basically did one on-chain transaction, and now I can do basically, you know, bound by the amount I put in, I can do several transactions in addition to that. Um, so uh, this had some limitations where I can, once I sent money to Andrew, he can send money back to me in that same channel. Instead, he may have had to open up another channel, and also had some issues with malleability and other things like that, and really didn't have widespread usage at that point. But then, uh, you know, people started messing around with bidirectional payment channels, which some of the initial constructions were basically, you have two channels. So, you know, I have a channel in his direction, and he has a channel in my direction. And using those two channels, we can now move money back and forth with each other. And, uh, you know, uh, the channels may get exhausted to some point, meaning all the money is on his side. But then there's some techniques where you can kind of do this, like, tree, to let you invalidate the prior states uh, using kind of time-like values. And then, uh, in 2015, came the Lightning Network. So the paper was originally written by, uh, by Joseph and Taj, um, you know, uh, people that initially kind of came up with, uh, with this technology. And uh, this is very cool because it addressed many of the other downsides of the prior payment channel construction and also allowed basically new, uh, new features into payment channels themselves. So uh, they basically based on uh, two main uh, fundamental techniques. One is the hash time lock contract, which is kind of like a conditional payment. And that's cool because this let you um, basically strip together payment channels and leverage the relationship to uh, to make payments over multi-hop. So basically before, uh, in order to actually string, to, string together payment channels, you kind of had to had a hub, right? So I would be connected to the hub, hub is connected to all these other participants, I actually push money to the hub, and the hub pushes money to who I want to pay. And this is kind of like more trusting because I actually trust the hub to basically continue the transfer. With HTLCs, we basically have end-to-end -end security, right? So I extend a conditional payment, you know, through whoever participant to the receiver. The receiver can then uh, redeem that payment, and either the payment happens or it doesn't. And in the failure cases, we basically have some things we can use to kind of reconcile the disputes without having a third party, because the blockchain itself is what is actually mediating the dispute. And we present the proof, and basically whoever wins wins. All right, so here's kind of like an overview of Lightning itself, right? So uh, you have Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob are basically want to make a channel, right? And to do so, they basically put money in what we call a uh, you know channel. It's kind of like an account, and it's it's like a two of two account, right? So uh, you can think of a normal account. Basically, you know, I put my money in there, and I can withdraw it whenever I want to. But this is a joint account, meaning that two people put money in, 
in order for the money to be reallocated and move around, both people have to sign off on these these transfers themselves, right? So uh, you know, and they use something called multi-signature in Bitcoin. It's kind of like a smart contract concept, and it basically lets you parameterize like uh, you know two parameters. One is n, and one is m. And n basically tells you the number of keys required to actually unlock a transaction, and m is the total set. So you know you can do like two or three, three or five, one or two. There's various constructions. For Lightning, we basically use two of two, meaning both participants need to be sign off on order to actually do a transfer. So they basically make this uh, two of two account. They put it in the blockchain after that point. And the cool part about this is once they actually put the money in the blockchain, they can do as many transfers back and forth as they want to. And this can basically be unlimited, right? So I could like basically you know do one transaction on the chain. I set up a program that basically you know has like a while loop and then just sends money back and forth, right? So you know with this already, you can kind of say it's like quote unquote infinity transactions per second because like uh, once I close the transaction back on chain, no one actually knows the amount of transactions I did off chain. So this is actually you know very very cool scalability technique because now we eliminate the full broadcast. We now have very low uh, fees and only the participants directly involved are actually involved in it. And um, and the core part about this is you know, either participant can exit the uh, contract at any given time. There are several clauses within the um, you know channel to let that happen. And that's also very compelling capability because no one's funds are really like you know they can't steal your funds, right? If they if they're inactive, then you basically close the channel and there's some security measures that you may need to wait a period of time. But with this, it's a very powerful contract, and this is basically the payment channel as we know it today. All right, this one, this is basically like the meat of, <laughs> there's, there's a lot on the slide, but I'll kind of unpack it. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do here is basically explain the kind of like two smart contracts involved in Lightning, right? Uh, and, you know, some people call this like crypto economics, kind of like a weird word. They kind of, it's kind of like fanciful, but, uh, you know, maybe we'll use that, we'll use that term from now. So the first one is basically the hash time lock contract, right? And this is like the conditional payment. So what this says is that like I have a special value and I will pay you if you can uh, give me kind of like the uh, the secret to this val value using hash value essentially. And uh, you know, if we just did that outright, then what would happen is basically my money could be suspended forever, right? So I would say, hey, you know, I'm gonna pay you if you give me this value, and then I just wait there and you never give me the value. Um, so, you know, and that would be bad because you, that would uh, allow people's funds to be locked up. So what we do is we add a special clause to that contract, right? And the clause is that there's a timeout value, which means that, okay, I will uh, you know, extend a payment and you have basically one day to settle the payment, and if you don't settle in one day, then I get my money back. So this is good for me because I know that I can, you know, extend this contract to you, and you can try to fulfill it. But if you don't, or you're unable to, or you know, somehow, you know, your computer blew up, and that's okay because I can get my money back. And that's like one of the, you know, powerful constructs about this. And uh, this is very cool because it also generalizes ops, as we'll see in uh, in another transaction. Uh, and the second uh, uh, contract is basically what we call uh, revocation, right? So you can imagine that, okay, we're updating this contract back and forth, right? You know, at one point maybe, you know, you had all the money, at one point maybe I had all the money. Um, so what's stopping me from basically going back to the point where I had the most money and broadcasting it, right? So I could theoretically use this to cheat you, right? So, um, you know, I pay you for a TV, basically, you know, maybe it's like however many euros, and then I go back in time using this prior state, and I try to, you know, commit that to the blockchain. If I can do that successfully, then, you know, I have this new TV, and I also have my money, and I cheated you. So the way we do this is we do something called revocations, right? So whenever we make a new state, you essentially like uh, give me a, a particular piece of state such that if you ever try to go backwards, I will get all of the money essentially. So we basically say no backseas, you know, you can't go backwards. If you ever do go backwards, you sign the contract that says I get all the money. So as a result, we basically have this kind of like deterrent where you know you can do it, but like uh, you know, if I'm online at that point, or I can even like outsource this um, capability, if you ever try to cheat me, I will get all the money in the contract. Therefore, we kind of incentivize people to always move forward in you know in the state and always faithfully execute the protocol because you know if anyone tries to deviate, then we have these basically trap doors or escape clauses. And you know in the ideal state, we never any we never use these like um, you know escape clauses because everyone just actually you know following the protocol honestly and we're optimistically just doing the transactions. But in the case that anything breaks down, then I have these two tools, you know, I have the timeout and I have the um, revocation clause. And the revocation clause basically lets me take all the money. All right, here's like the classic slide. This slide's probably like two or three years old at this point, but we keep reusing it. <laughs> so this is basically how, you know, a mock-up of Lightning itself, right? So these blue lines, they're each individual channels. So it means, you know, Alice open channel with Bob, the same two of two, Bob with Carol, another two of two, and then Carol with Dave, another two of two. Um, so, you know, before we had basically uh, HTLCs, 
if you know Alice wanted to be able to pay you know all of these participants, she would have to have a channel open with every single other participant, right? And that doesn't really scale because all of a sudden you basically need to be connected to everybody in the world in order to have that capability to maybe pay them. But instead, we can utilize these existing connections in order to now do a conditional payment. So uh, what Alice wants to do is Alice wants to utilize this basically this graph. It's kind of like you know like like a network to pay Dave without opening a new channel. So this is what happens. This is basically the protocol in Lightning. It's a little bit different than kind of like the Bitcoin trust, but uh, it's a little bit similar. So rather than like the address, you know, it sounds like a one if you've seen it, and a bunch of like you know random characters. There's instead a concept called H, which is the payment hash, right? So in order to generate H, Dave generates a random value, basically you know using it's a very very big random value, so it's something that's unguessable uh, because you know it's like this has so many bits that you can you know try to enumerate all the values, and then uh, Dave hashes that value. And the hash has a special property where, given the hash, you can't go backward to the previous itself. So then Dave gives Alice this, pre this uh, hash, and what Alice does is Alice extends a conditional payment to Bob, and Bob and this basically says, "Hey, Bob, I will pay you, you know, one one Bitcoin if you know R, which is kind of like the secret to unlock this puzzle, and you need you have three days to give this to me, otherwise I get my money back." And Bob goes to Carol, and then Bob's like, "Hey, Carol, uh, you know, if you have the puzzle, the secret, uh, you know, so the puzzle R, I will pay you, and you have two days to do so." So now, you know, Bob has like a window of opportunity to see what happens with the, with the two contracts, and then finally goes from Carol to Dave, and the same thing is, uh, you know, Carol says, "Hey, Dave, I will give you, you know, one Bitcoin if you can give me R, which is the secret, within one day." Dave is like, "Okay, you know, I have this secret because I generated." So now, at this point, you know, all of the contracts have been cleared. So, uh, because each of the participants have uh, this kind of conditional contract, the money is kind of in limbo, right? So, uh, if everything, if Dave went away, everyone still gets their money back. But because Dave now knows the secret value, Dave can then settle backwards along the route, right? And uh, so it's kind of like a two-step process. The first step is extending the HLC, and the second step is now settling backwards. Uh, yeah. So the reveal is there. And then that's it. And so basically, that's how the multi-dot payment works, right? So you have, you know, a series of participants. Everyone incrementally extends this conditional payment until it gets to the receiver. Once the receiver knows the secret value, it can then settle that instantly backwards. So the cool part about this is, you know, we had a very small network here. You know, basically four participants and three channels. We can imagine, you know, maybe you have like, you know, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, and as long as you have this kind of path between, you know, Alice to Dave, then Alice can send money to Dave. You know, pending some other caveats about like, you know, fees. And channel capacity and things like that. With this loan, we basically have a you know very powerful construct where we now have this kind of like payment graph, which has instant payments. The payments are uh, you know pretty predictable. Um, you know they're basically clauses put into the system such that participants can't be cheated. Um, you know likely because uh, if anyone has a dispute, then they go to the blockchain and the blockchain settles the disputes, right? So it's kind of like an interesting take on you know the way people were doing you know payments before, where before it was all on chain, but now we only go on chain in the worst case. So the blockchain itself now acts as kind of like a mediator. You know, it's not really trusted because it's just like it's the program. We, we know the program will execute, you know, our contract faithfully the entire time. All right, so that was kind of like the past. Oh, the emojis didn't really show. Okay, I had emojis, but they didn't really show up well. That's okay. Uh, so that was about the past, and this kind of like, uh, you know, moving a little bit more to the present. So, uh, you know, scaling Bitcoin Milan was last October. Cool. Uh, you know, they basically, you know, Bitcoin experts and research from around the world. They came together, you know, talked about, you know, how do we move Bitcoin technology forward, and uh, you know, how do we continue to work together, and so on. And so basically, after scaling Bitcoin in Milan, we had like the Lightning Summit in Milan. Um, so before this, you know, there were basically like a bunch of like mailing list posts, and there were people that were interested in building Lightning. And we were talking to each other, you know, on the mailing list on the IRC, you know, traditional like Bitcoin like forums. And then since we were all basically in the same place, we're like, okay, like let's get together to actually make this a protocol, right? Because before then there was like the paper, and you know it uh, kind of had like was well, it was like a des design outline. So it had the core components of the system, but didn't really tell you how to put that together and actually make the network right. Maybe it like kind of alluded to it, but didn't go into detail where you could basically take the paper and fully implement the uh, specification. So what we did is we met up and we were there for two days, and the goal was essentially to, to like you know brainstorm and figure out exactly what would go into the Lightning specification. Because you know, once we have a specification, then we know this is the standard, and anyone that says they're doing Lightning, they're doing this, and it also can be you know very good educational resources for people that actually want to know about the protocol. And it was pretty cool. You know, we talked about many topics, including kind of how do fees work, because you know um, the payments aren't free, but there are fees, but they're a very small amount. Uh, we talked about um, you know how do you stop people from like taking down the network? 
talk about you know how does routing work, you know how to payment request, the addresses, what's like the payment flow, because you know, we're basically starting from the ground up, you know, building a new protocol on top of Bitcoin. So it was very cool that we could get together and you know talk about all these things. And out of the Lightning Summit in Milan, basically came the Bolts, right? So what Bolts stand for is basis of Lightning technology, and these basically like a series of RFCs, kind of like IETF style RFCs that um, you know explain you know in very good technical detail basically how to implement Lightning the protocol. So um, the current set of specifications, uh, you can find it at basically github.com slash lightning network slash lightning dash RFC. And it uh, spans like nine documents now. Maybe it's like 10 or 11. There's like some that we may add or may remove. And this basically covers everything, right? So the goal is that given, you know, this set of documents, you can read them all, you know, assuming some understanding of like, you know, Bitcoin and peer to peer networks and so on. Then you can read these all and basically create a complete lightning implementation. And uh, we're getting there, you know, it goes into things like, you know, how do you open a channel? What do channels look like? How do fees look like? You know, how do you know how do people find each other on the network? How do you communicate? You know that I want to route a channel. How do you communicate what my fees are? You know, so all of that stuff is actually in the specifications, and uh, you know a lot of hard work has gone into it. And uh, we're actually here again with many of the people that were there in October. We've got uh, you know Fabrice and Pierre, and also Christian Becker here. So it's kind of like a little re reunion, <laughs> which has been cool. Um, so uh, out of that, basically, uh, you know, as time went on, basically there were three implementations. And the three are, we have C-Lightning, uh, which Tucker works on, and then we have Eclair, which is uh, Fabrice and uh, Pierre, and then we have L&D, um, you know, which I work on, and then also Johan and Jimmy who are here uh, working on this as well. And the cool part about this, because we have a specification, we can now work towards compatibility, right? So, you know, uh, it'd be kind of weird if maybe there were only like one, you know, uh, code base for this. It wouldn't be very resilient, and um, at that point, it'd kind of be like, like a walled garden, only like one person controlling everything. But instead, you know, basically this is just like Bitcoin, it's a collaborative airport, it's, it's open source, and anyone can join and contribute at any given time, and all the, all the, all the code is also open source. So uh, the main thing we're working on now is basically cross compatibility, given that, you know, we can have multiple participants, uh, multiple different implementations, and they should all be able to run payments with, between each other. And, you know, that gives you a lot of freedom, because if you say, you know, I don't trust their software, I want to write my own software, you know, I want to do it in like Erlang or like Haskell or some crazy thing like that, and you can do so, because it's all there in the specifications. All right, now uh, I'm kind of going to take like a little, a little brief tour of some of the newer components that uh, we added to uh, the bolts themselves. So, you know, the original lightning paper talked about mostly what do channels look like and how do you open channels and so on. And, uh, you know, it was called lightning network, but the network part was mostly, was mostly missing, right? It only told you how to open a channel and basically kind of the routing. But, you know, our job is, you know, the, the uh, co-authors of the bolts were kind of to put everything else together and create the network itself. Um, so starting with the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So cool thing about uh, Lightning is that inherently every single connection is fully encrypted. Right? This means that people can't just eavesdrop passively and learn certain information. Um, so you know the way the Bitcoin network works today, there are you know some standards to make it encrypted, but it's not currently. So as a result, anyone can basically just sniff traffic and they can learn information like you know who's paid who, uh, you know that you're running Bitcoin node and so on. So what we did is you know off the bat we decided everything was going to be fully encrypted. Uh, it's cool because, uh, oh yeah, this is bolt number eight. Like I was saying, there's you know, a series of documents. We refer to them by their, um, uh, by their number, and this basically covers the encrypted transport. And uh, bolt eight is cool because it uses kind of this like, cool, like modern uh, cryptographic framework. Um, so if you've ever used like Signal or like WhatsApp, uh, this thing called Noise was made by you know, the same creator, Trevor Perrin, and uh, you know, it's very cool crypto, and uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty quick. And all the participants basically use this between each other. And uh, some cool things about it is that this is kind of like the message framing format. So rather than all the messages being in plain text, basically everything is encrypted and fully authenticated, meaning that no one can like flip a bit and make you accept the packet. And also, you know, if Andrew sends me a packet, then I know it's actually him. So this is kind of like the framing. First, we have the message length, which itself is actually encrypted because you know that can give away some information about um, you know what the packet is and so on. Um, and then we have a Mac for that, and that's some like reasons about some like padding Oracle stuff and things. And then we have the message itself, and then a Mac of the message. And this is cool because uh, with this, then we basically just have these like random blobs in the stream, and it can be difficult to basically ascertain additional information about that. And we can do things like padding and basically you know throw people off and, and cool stuff. Oh yeah, and then uh, it's called noise, and it's cool because like we're on the website now. It basically goes like WhatsApp, Lightning, and then something called WireGuard, which is a VPN. But I think I thought that was pretty cool. Basically connects to WhatsApp. Um, yeah. So then, wait, did I skip a slide? All right, so then continuing then now, uh, basically more of the peer-to-peer -peer networking layer. So one thing that was left out of the original paper is basically, you know, how do you communicate, I have a channel, right? And this is basically, how does a node who joins the network, you know, form that graph? And if you, you know, remember back to like, you know, three or four slides back, we had that graph from Alice, Mark, to Carol, 
the question is, how does Alice find out about you know Bob and Carol's channels, and how does uh, Alice actually validate that the channels are real? So this is divine from the call of Bolt Seven. So it's cool because we basically made the graph into kind of like an authenticated data structure, meaning that you know, given a piece of information, you can verify that it's actually valid, right? And the things you verify is you say, is, how do I know this is a channel? And the reason you know it's a channel is because we give you information so we can look up in the blockchain, you know, confirm that this is an active, uh, you know, two of two account that hasn't yet, you know, had its fund been withdrawn from. And we also give you pieces of information so that, you know, I need a, I need a basically a proof that you can actually update the channel. And the proof is a signature, you know, both signatures of the two of two accounts in the blockchain itself. And then with this, I can basically say, okay, I have all the information, I verified it, and I, I now put it in my graph. And this is cool because now, um, you know, it's not possible for someone to give you fake information, right? Something we always talk about, you know, in Bitcoin is basically the simple attack. So how can how how do we can we prevent someone from coming up, you know, having a bunch of identities, and giving us a bunch of fake information, and making us basically route for a non-existent graph? And we solve this basically in Bolt Seven because uh, essentially, you know, you have to prove your channels. And this also covers things like, you know, how do I communicate my fees? Okay, this is my fee in this direction. How do I like you know communicate preferences? Or maybe you know, uh, HLC is too small, and so on. And that's all in Bolt Number Seven. All right, here we go. All right, now we're talking about routing a little bit, right? Uh, you know, so continuing, uh, this we use like a bunch of cool crypto in Lightning, and this is about Sphinx, right? So to, to frame it for a second, the way routing works in Lightning is that it's called source routing, meaning that me as the sender, I pick the entire route, right? So when Alice was, was sending from Bob to Carol to Dave, Alice knew a priori that you know this is my entire route that I'm sending to. Um, this is cool because this lets Alice basically can fully control everything about the route, meaning she knows the fees ahead of time, she knows the worst case delay, and she basically knows all the participants. So you know, you can imagine that if we didn't use uh, onion routing, which is kind of what Tor does, then what would happen is you know Bob would get that payment and says, oh, it's going to Dave, and you know I don't like Dave, so therefore I would drop the packet, and that basically you know is like you know is centering on the network. And the whole point of this technology is, you know, to make you know censorship resistant financial services, and we extend that by using onion routing within the protocol itself. So onion routing is cool because uh, you know, this basically was used in Tor, where uh, so by onion I mean that you know you take some data and you basically encrypt it, and then you encrypt it again, and then again. So now you have these like layers of encryption, and only the participants in the route can decrypt those layers of encryption. And uh, this has very cool properties because um, none of the participants necessarily know their location in the queue. They don't know who the sender is. They don't know who the receiver is. All they know is, you know, I get this message, I look at it, and I forward it, I forward it this way. And this basically gives them the minimum amount, minimal amount of information. All they know is if I forward this message and it comes back to me, I get some sort of fee. And this is good because uh, at this point they can't try to, you know, selectively Just censor. Second, uh, sorry. S since uh, there are happening things like the secret uh, private key of Satoshi is one, zero, and, uh, and so you are missing some part. Probably since it's infrared. Uh, you should just uh, avoid to cover with the hand or something like that. Oh, just okay. try. I don't, so don't, don't do this. Just oh, probably. Okay, make it open. Ah, it's coming. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. There it is. It's closing now. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. That's that's fine. Right. Yeah, yeah. uh, we'll just do that. <laughs> All right, so basically, uh, this is what, it's like an end routing protocol within Lightning itself. So what we do is we have the special packet, and what the packet does is, you know, it's fully encrypted and authenticated, and it basically just gives you basic information, right? So in addition to telling you, you know, who the next op is, basically who should you pay next, we also include some per op information. Uh, this actually changed kind of recently, so this diagram is dated, but uh, basically in each of the hops, we basically give them a payload. And the payload gives them additional instructions to basically how to forward the payment, and this basically lets them tell you, okay, uh, this is the fee, and the fee is compute. The fee is in practice actualized by you forwarding out less than you forwarded in, right? So you know, if I was taking a half Bitcoin fee, I get one Bitcoin in. I send out you know half a Bitcoin, which basically now you know I'm you know half a Bitcoin up, and then I continue the transactions. So uh, in here, we basically put all the information, and we also encoded it in here because this allows the uh, hop to basically verify the information. So it could be the case that one of the prior hops basically modified the information, maybe to you know to give them more fees or try to try to throw up the route. But because we have this and it's fully end-to-end -end authenticated, then they're not able to do so. All right. So now uh, moving on a little bit. So Lightning beyond a laptop, right? So uh, currently, uh, or, you know, until this, most of the implementations were basically required a full node. And like I was saying before, you know, full nodes can be pretty resource intensive. It's like probably over 150 gigabytes uh, now in order to actually run one. So what we want to do is basically create a lightweight execution mode. 
And by lighter weight, I mean you know something that can run on your phone, maybe a Raspberry Pi, maybe even smaller devices. You know, we'll see about that later. But this can be very cool because at this point we can have you know very very small devices running Lightning, right? So this can be, can be maybe like someone's router who is you know forwarding payments. It's kind of like a mesh network, and they're getting paid per minute based on that. This could be maybe like your your water meter, and the water meter itself is verifying in real time, you know, how much water you're consuming, and basically paying that up to the uh, you know, uh, uh, the water company in real time, or electricity, and so on. So if we can basically get you a version that can run on smaller devices, then this can be used, uh, you know, uh, in much wider areas, and that can be really cool. Um, so we kind of, we're kind of looking at what were we, what were we going to do to actually implement this. So in Bitcoin, there are things called light clients, and light clients are kind of characterized that um, you don't need the entire blockchain in order to actually use them. But uh, you know, the, the previous version of light clients were called Bit37, and Bit37 was kind of lacking. You know, it it had some weird security models, and uh, it was kind of hard to build upon, and um, you know had the possibility for us being censored. So it wasn't really uh, you know, applicable to our uh, to what we wanted to do. So we were looking into kind of an alternative uh, client. So first I kind of go over some of the drawbacks of the way BIP37 works, right? Um, so the way BIP37 works is that a client sends the full node what they're interested in, right? So now the client is trusting the full node to basically faithfully give them that information back when the time comes. So as a result, uh, you know, the full node can now collect a bunch of these like filters, which basically include you know, what your addresses are, what you're interested in, and then you, people could basically abuse this to make full nodes kind of be DOS, right? And the way you do this is that you would give the full node a filter that basically matches everything. So as a result, the full node basically would read every single block, and almost every single thing that was in the block would match the to send data to you. And as a result, you, know, you could have like 50 clients connect to one node, and it would basically consume a lot of disk, and IO, and bandwidth, and so on. And uh, you know, this was made in about 2012 or so, and that's like a very, very long time in cryptocurrency land. You know, it's over like five years, and basically like a lot of things happen in like the span of a month or even like two days, like we're finding out right now. So uh, we thought it needed a refresh. So instead, we uh, you know kind of piggybacked off an idea called Bloom Filter Digest, right? And uh, this was kind of proposed on Bitcoin Wizards, which is this kind of like research channel on IRC back in 2014 or so. And uh, you know, as usual, some like random nickname comes in and says, "Hey, why don't we reverse the direction of the filters?" Everyone's like. That makes sense. Like that actually works. Like why didn't we think of this in the past? And everyone's like, you know, kind of had a pretty like good consensus just as soon as the idea was even like birthed. So that was cool. So the way this works is rather than the client sending the, um, the full node, the kind of the server, the filter, what the nodes do is for every single block they make a filter, right? And that filter includes you know whose money has been moving around, basically you know what output was spent and what money was created and you know what transactions were actually in the block itself. The full node then gives this filter to the client. And the client now has to filter locally. And the client is then able to query the filter to see you know, what addresses are in there and if it's relevant to them. And then if it's relevant, and you know, we also have this false positive ratio as well, then it fetches the block from somewhere. And the core thing is that it doesn't have to fetch the block directly from the full node, it can fetch it from any source at all. So basically, the new mode is now the clients download these filters, they check them locally, and they get the block from any source. And uh, this is cool because uh, you know, they can hit some server and get the block, right? They could do kind of more complex cryptography to have you know some assurance that the phone doesn't know exactly which block they're going to. And this is a cool model because it kind of gives the application a little bit more flexibility that it doesn't need to like rely on this kind of like interactive process. It's kind of like a two-step thing. You know, get the filter, check it, and then maybe get the work itself. Uh, and then so we what we did is we took uh, you know the original version of it and we added a few improvements. So we added a way um, that um, is this it? Oh wait, no, these are the improvements from uh, the 37 actually itself. So the cool thing about this is now it's all passive. So basically, the phone node just reads data and then gives that to the client. Um, it also doesn't actually give away transaction level information because with Bit37 before, the phone node would send you a transaction that, that it thinks you're interested in, right? And that kind of restricts your, your set of anonymity because it knows which transactions you're interested in. Well, with this, we now it's all, now on the block level, right? So you know there could be thousands of transactions in the block. You know maybe tens of thousands of actual you know individual in, inputs and outputs. So therefore, you have like a bigger set of um, anonymity. And the cool part about this is the client is actually able to verify the information given to by the full node. Because you know, once you have a filter given a block, because the filters are constructed uh, deterministically, the client can regenerate the filter and then ensure that something something actually happens. Um, so uh, we worked you know, for a few months on this, and then we eventually created a BIP, right? And what BIPs are, it's, it's a Bitcoin improvement proposal. And you know, whenever anyone wants to like, ask them to Bitcoin, whether it's kind of like on the peer to level, or a new transaction type, or something new in script itself, you basically have a proposal. And what we did is we you know, prepared it. You can find it here. Uh, it was me and another person on our team, uh, Alex Axelrod, who is uh, in the US right now. 
and then we ended up posting it to the mailing list, and in conjunction with that, we also posted a reference implementation. And so the reference implementation, uh, it basically included all of the new features itself, and we also took a full node called BTCD. Uh, you know, maybe it's not that well, well, well known as Bitcoin Core, but it also implements you know, all full validation, and we went to a version that's able to serve this new version of the white client. And uh, you know, in order to do this, we basically added a few new things to Bitcoin, right? Um, so I'll go over them kind of like at, at a high level. So the first thing is we added a service bit. And what service bits do is the service bits let clients find other nodes who implement a particular feature. So uh, you know, without this, basically, it wouldn't know who could serve it. But with this, it can now basically scan the nodes, either you know, actively by connecting to them, or basically through DNS to find someone that actually implement a particular um, new feature that it has. And then we also ended up bumping up protocol version because we added a new feature. So as a result, we basically import the version. And then we added a few new messages. The messages are basically uh, allow you to query kind of what types of filters the full node has, because in the proposal, there's different types of filters depending on you know, exactly what your needs are. So there's one filter called the regular filter, and that's basically just what laws want to sync normally. And there's one called the extended filter, which has a little more information in it, and it's kind of used for more advanced smart contract uh, applications. And then we have two messages called the filter headers. Um, so because this actually isn't consensus, meaning it's like within blocks itself, we have this kind of mega layer that lets the clients actually verify what uh, data they're getting. And then finally, we have message, uh, uh, message to actually get the filters themselves. So the, the clients, once they have all the block headers normal, they get the filters and then use that and then actually verify it locally to see if it matches them or not. And you know the filters are very cool because in the past, um, doing something like a rescan basically took hours, right? What a rescan is, is you have your full node and maybe uh, you know you had database corruption or you added a new address, it would basically need to like read the entire chain and rebuild the index in order to see what your current balance was, right? And you know, as the chain gets bigger and bigger, this now basically takes probably like over like six hours or something like that. Like it's a very, very resource intensive process. But with the filters, what the client can now do is they can get the filters over RPC or whichever other mechanism, query that locally, and then maybe get the block themselves. Or this can be used within the node also to basically have a passive version of rescans. And uh, another cool thing about this is that um, uh, the key import for like mobile clients is much easier now, right? So you basically have you know a uh, Bitcoin wallet on your phone, and you can like, this now basically you takes probably like before it would basically have to almost fetch the entire chain, and uh, that would be a lot of bandwidth. But now we can query the filters. And the cool thing about the filters is that it's kind of like a more natural application model because before it required like a high degree of interaction. You basically, you know, you sent the filters to the full node, the full node sent you a Merkle proof, and then transaction themselves. But with this, you basically just have the filters. So uh, any any uh, application kind of like Lightning that depends on on chain events and the events we're looking for, basically, you know, a channel was open, channel was closed, uh, one was spent, can be all figured out locally if that happened or not. And then, so then comes Neutrino. So Neutrino is basically uh, what we, it's, it's the light client we made, and this is kind of the reference implementation of the initial bit itself. And it's written, you know, uh, using Go and our chef libraries that we use throughout LND itself. Uh, and uh, the goal for Neutrino is basically to make like an application platform. So it's not a wallet itself, it's just a light client. Meaning it's able to, you know, sync the chain, verify that you're on Bitcoin, you know, the, the, the chain with the hash proof work itself and then gives you basically a bunch of hooks to let you easily make applications on top of this. So we took Neutrino, that's the bottom layer, and we made a wallet on top of that. So the wallet basically you know, handles like the rescan logic and getting the keys, addresses, and then we made a uh, lightning implementation on top of that, which was LND itself. Uh, and the cool part about this is this can be reused you know, for anyone else that wants to make uh, an application on top of Bitcoin that needs a little, little more lightweight mode. Um, so with this, we put it out there. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's mostly there, we basically have some more optimizations to do. But we're basically using this to so we can start to um, you know get lightning on mobile phones, and we have some basically some preliminary versions of it running on both Android and iOS. So this is kind of the goal and the initial uh, you know, rationale for making the new light client, because if you can get lightning on smaller devices, it can actually be usable in real time. You know, you can imagine you know you're doing point of sale, you scan the QR code, you send your payment, or maybe there's like a game in your uh, you know there's a game that has kind of like in-game micropayments, and you're actually using lightning natively you know through the application to actually send uh, you know money to like. Facebook or like uh, Zynga or you know whatever Farmville or whatever you're playing. Um, yeah, so as of right now, uh, Neutrino is integrated into uh, LND, which is like our Lightning network implementation, and it's cool because now uh, you know we have a much lightweight version, and developers can use it to get up to speed with Lightning very quickly. So in its current state, um, not many other full nodes have, have, implemented, have implemented this, but we have people that are working on implementing it for Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin etc. So now you can basically have a very lightweight uh, version of Lightning that requires basically only LND. So uh, and the state for this is also very very compact. You know, it's like in the 
megabytes to range rather than like gigabytes compared to like the actual full, full, full node. And uh, like on testnet, like use the current version, you can sync, um, you know, uh, mainnet in like, I think it's like two or three minutes, which is pretty pretty quick compared to basically like hours or whatever from, um, uh, from, uh, from mainnet. I mean, for actually like, you know, full node. And I think testnet, which has like a million plus uh, headers, it can do that in about like five minutes or so. So, you know, so it's much faster. And this is very cool because now you can basically, you know, do like plug and play. The goal is, you know, you download lightning on your phone or, you know, or your wallet or whatever. You know, you wait a little bit, five minutes or so, and you can start connecting to the network and put money into it in an open channel, and then you join the network basically instantaneously. Um, and that's it. Wait, do I have another slide? Yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Any questions? Questions? Okay. Okay. I will start with. Was that time that you were referencing before for the sync? Was it just for the just for the initial setup? Um, it's it's like this. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's like by uh, sync. I mean, basically, you know, fetching all of the Bitcoin block headers and then fetching all of these filter headers we have themselves. And they're basically two sets of filter headers, and these basically let the clients verify that the filters they get are kind of like you know, unanimous amongst the peers. So uh, you know, from, from when they're syncing from tip, rather than like getting the filter from, from every single peer, which you know, can be a lot of data, if you have you know, 20 peers, you instead get the new header, you can pair that the headers match up, and you get the filter itself. Then you, if you need the block, you get the block, and you can verify the filter is actually there. So this is basically just downloading all the filters, you know, uh, downloading the entire chain, and then indexing the chain also. So you can say, you know, give me block, you know, five hundred thousand. It can, you know, give me five hundred thousand. Yeah. And you know, the core part is that, like, uh, because you're just making a new wallet, you don't necessarily need to get all of the prior filters and all of history. You basically just need to get, you know, get you to the current state that you have now. And if you ever need to download prior filters due to an application, or maybe you're doing analysis, then you can do so lazily. So you can basically, you know, get, you know, filter number 10, and then 20, and then 50, and so on. It doesn't need to be basically the entire thing itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Like a lightsaber. Uh, we, we know that theoretically, we have read that theoretically, a uh, live network will work uh, in theory also without uh, segregated witness, even if uh, not uh, as well. Uh, the fir my first question would be, what would we miss exactly uh, of what you described uh, in case uh, we, we should uh, uh, force it to go without uh, segregated? And the second question would be, uh, of course, we, will, uh, we are going to have segregated nodes. But in this very, very strange uh, eventuality that was not going to happen because uh, an asteroid, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, are there already contingency plans or we just uh, wait uh, and, uh, and pay with uh, testnet coin or with Litecoin, which are other testnet coins? Sure. Yeah, so the first part about SegWit. So SegWit is kind of this like upgrade to Bitcoin that's been working in slow motion for a while. We thought it was going to be a little bit quicker. We're going to take longer than we thought. But uh, something I glossed over is that previously there were payment channels, but they were limited lifetime. Meaning that you basically you open a channel and then five days later, or you know some amount of days, you basically have to close it, right? And uh, you know that's kind of limiting because you as a user or the software itself, uh, ideally, is going to need to decide how you know what duration should this be open. And that depends on a lot of parameters. You can have a delay experience, and then also uh, it could be the case that you picked a date that was too short, so you basically need to reopen the channel, right? Now that's basically like traffic just to reopen the channel, and that kind of like you know offsets some of the scalability benefits. One thing SegWit allows us to do very cleanly is we can have channels that can be open forever, right? So you can have channels that can open for months, for years. So like right now, my laptop, I have a channel that's been open maybe for like four months on testnet, and it just stays there. And I can you know open my laptop and use it, and then and that's fine. Uh, and then another major benefit of having um, SegWit is basically that malleability is solved in a clean way where the way that uh, these transactions work is kind of like a tree structure. So you have one transaction dependent on another transaction, right? And if that other transaction gets invalidated, then this one does as well. So you can have a worst scenario where even though we have a, you know, ideally, you can always get your money back. If the transaction got malleated, then you basically wouldn't have a valid signature to unlock your money. And there's kind of like some worse situations around that. Another major thing is that I mentioned before that there's that case where, uh, you know, someone can try to like go backwards and possibly cheat you by, you know, broadcasting a prior state. 
With SegWit, we can do this thing called outsourcing. We can basically give a server basically very, very minimal, minimal, minimal amount of information, which doesn't even reveal exactly which channel uh, you are. And that server can then act on your behalf and basically, so you know, if I was going away on a vacation for like, you know, for three weeks, I can rest in peace because I am, well, not rest in peace, like peace of mind, I guess. <laughs> I can have, <laughs> I'm not that, you know, um, I can have peace of mind that basically everything will be, will be fine. Uh, and the second question he asked is basically, what if Bitcoin doesn't get, you know, its act together? Um, so, uh, like he was saying, there are other chains. One is Litecoin, which is like, uh, you know, was made way back and kind of didn't really have any compelling features until it had SegWit. So that's an option for us, you know, and we could basically use Litecoin as kind of a test bed, because Litecoin, I guess, has, like, like it's like a billion dollars now, you know, yeah, this, this bubble right now, but, um, and then, you know, Bitcoin is like, I guess, 45 billion now, so it's like, it's like, like a very large step. So we can basically test our software out on you know, something that's a little bit smaller scale, make sure it's actually hard and you know, works well, and then go to basically you know, Bitcoin, which is like the big time, and then make cryptocurrency. But in the case where maybe something happens with Litecoin or Bitcoin never happens, then we can still do it, but it'll be kind of more limited in terms of its capability, and it'll be a little bit hacky. So ideally, you know, we get malleability fix, and the main one that's on the page right now is SegWit. It has a bunch of testing, you know, I have influence of it, and you know, I think it's pretty good. When you were talking before about the scenario where Alice was paying Jay by the Bob and Carol, and uh, the the fact that the payment was going to uh, happen for everybody or no one, depending on the on the secret being revealed by Jay and the increasing time lots between the participants, uh, that does impose a limit on how how long the chain can be due to the fact that you have to have increase in time locks and uh, guarantee that everybody can redeem the money if the, the next party doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, cooperate. Does this uh, impose a limit on the chain and is this limiting in some way uh, to the implementation of IT network or is, or is this okay? Sure. So I guess the like, uh, answer is like yes and no. Uh, no in that you know, the time locks can be basically as long as possible and uh, it could reach a point where you as a node, if you get a time lock of like 180 days, you're just like no because you declined that, right? But because we have kind of this like onion routing layer on top of it, and one of the key features of the onion routing layer is that like you basically have these routing instructions, right? And they remain fixed size throughout the entire route because that uh, lets us not give away information about how long the route is or basically where you are in the route itself. And currently in the uh, specification, the hard coding uh, parameter is 20. So you can have a max of 20 hours itself. Which, you know, if you think about it, it's pretty big because, you know, both with pathing algorithms give you a path and, like, you know, the path itself is like a log in itself. So 20, you know, you have a pretty, pretty large um, graph. And if it comes to the point where maybe we actually, you know, deploy, we say 20 is not enough, we need like 40, we can increase it. But we think 20 will be sufficient. So uh, let's say that like, Alice has to pay Bob, uh, and there are like uh, uh, different possible paths to, to to reach Bob. Like, how does uh, like that, does she just go for the first path that she found, or she uh, like try different ones to, to find the shortest one, or like that there is some kind of optimization for, for finding the best version? Yeah. So uh, like you were saying, you know, if there was only one path, then she would basically try that, and that would be it, right? But, you know, ideally, rather than looking for one single path, you basically try to find, you know, the case shortest paths, um, you know, to the destination. And a shorter path is better because, you know, there's less hops in the path, which would uh, possibly mean less fees and then less uh, time launch as well. So, uh, you know, one strategy she can do is Alice can basically first find the K paths. You know, they are various lengths. And uh, or each of the participants can actually set a different value for their fees, right? So just because, uh, you know, it's two hops doesn't necessarily mean it will be less fees to maybe some one person is charging very high fees. So once it has, you know, those set of uh, candidate routes, you can basically, you know, if you want to optimize for fees, you can then basically sort of convert to fees and then try those uh, serially itself. And uh, the way it works is that if you try a route and for some reason uh, the participant isn't there or it failed for some reason, you get a cancel backwards, right? So it's, it's kind of like, a, like a, an error when you send it. So, you know, you get the error, you say, okay, that didn't work. I launch the next route, send it, that didn't work, the next one, and then hopefully, you know, that one works itself. So there's basically kind of like, a, like an error recovery process involved in it. And the cool part also is like, you know, like before the, uh, we had running routing, basically encryption, you know, in the route itself, but also we, we use a similar protocol in order to send the errors backwards. So basically the participants don't really know themselves, you know, who, or rather, like what the nature of the error was, because that, that give away information. 
And so basically, when you send an error back, you encrypt it and then send it back to the backwards route. And so we basically reuse it for that uh, crypto. So like every participant of the chain, only not the two people like uh, uh, before or after in the chain that don't know who are the, the people actually doing the transaction, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so, so they know basically the, you know, who's behind them and then who they support it to. Uh, you know, in the ideal case, you know, uh, you know, just as an example, if the graph was of like size three, you know, basically that's all they knew, they could say, okay, maybe that this is who it is. But also there's features where like, uh, talking about announcing channels, you don't necessarily need to announce a channel. So there's kind of like a possible deniability that there, maybe there's some like special like secret graph beyond this, which they could be routed to. And, uh, you know, there's some other things we can do to try to like obfuscate your position with the time lock values uh, and other things like that. Thank you. When I now want to receive a payment in the Lightning Network, I have to give uh, the age uh, of which I get the R. And uh, I get the, the method is to give something like an invoice. OK. But in the future, is it feasible to have uh, something like uh, an extension of uh, BIP70 payment request or something like that? Uh, yeah, you know, so we could definitely piggyback on top of that. And uh, we have something that's similar to that, where it's kind of like an invoice, but the invoice can have additional information. And the cool part also is the invoice itself is signed, right? So meaning if I get the signed invoice and I pay to them, then I basically have a proof of uh, payment, right? And I can use this and say, you know, I deposited it. It's it's yeah, like a receipt, yeah. And this is, you know, it's way better than, uh, you know, if right now if I go to like Bitfinex and I, you know, want to deposit, I have an address and I send the money and basically like that's it, right? I don't really have any recourse. With this, I basically have the signed receipt. So, okay. you know, which is what, you know, Bip70 sought to basically address, but uh, I didn't really catch on that much because of like the, um, you know, uh, it was tied to kind of like uh, certificates. And so, you know, we can basically make something else that maybe isn't as tied to that and a little more flexible. And then eventually that we may want to send a lot more data along with our payment request that maybe, you know, I give you like a partial route along with it or other data like that. So, yeah. so initially it may look like, you know, something kind of like a random string, so much like the current addresses. And then later on, maybe, you know, you click a web page and your app pops up and sends it and that's it. I have another one. Uh, again, a political question. So, <laughs> so uh, supposing that there is actually a conflict between uh, the uh, the miners that are serving the layer one of Bitcoin and the existence of, or the or the implications of layer two, uh, and supposing that there could be some interest in, so, into attacking or censoring uh, uh, a Latin network implementation from the miner, is uh, a channel closing uh, uh, transaction? Uh, easy to mask or to hide, or uh, its characteristics are such that uh, it's trivial for uh, for miners to, to detect uh, transaction closing and to in interfere with that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the opening transactions they basically create a multisig, right? And multisig is like you know script hash or pay to win the script hash or whatever, and that looks distinct because uh, you know it's a different script template type, right? So let's say if they wanted to say, okay, no more multi-sigs, no more lightning, then basically they're basically restrict that and wouldn't mine any, um, you know, multi-sig and will let any multi-sig spends through, right? But that is a tough lightning because there are techniques where you can basically take what looks like a regular, you know, public key for, uh, you know, public key ask transaction, like the regular one Bitcoin address, and you can actually make that into a two of two uh, key itself. So we could basically, you know, blend in with all the other traffic, basically because it looks like people are sending regular payments, where they actually channels opening, opening and closings. So we can kind of at least, uh, you know, mask ourselves in that anonymity set of regular open and closed transactions, and then we can also maybe modify some of the way the HLCs work itself to, um, you know, put all of the logic basically in kind of, um, you know, just the keys, kind of like, you know, the script the script stuff that Pulse is talking about, basically to make to make it such that like all this fancy smart contract stuff basically blends in with the regular traffic. So if we ever have basically like large scale war, <laughs> you know, we have basically terraflash techniques that we can try to use. That will work uh, only in a scenario where, where after SegWit we activate also Genar and Mast, uh, not just with plain simple SegWit, right? Um, so, uh, Shenora makes it easier, definitely. You know, you can basically do it retroactively, but uh, there also are protocols that let you basically do like a two of two distributed EC ECDSA signing. So you can do it on ECDSA. It kind of has some more uh, fancy crypto. Uses something called Pallier, which is kind of like homomorphic encryption. So you can basically, you know, take two encrypted values and add them together, and then decrypt that. And the decryption is the sum of those, you know, encrypted plaintext values. Um, so you can, you can basically use that 
in conjunction with a special protocol from CDSA, and use that to construct basically a tool to multi-sig with a single Bitcoin key. Yeah, so if it comes down to it, we have the tools, uh, you know, so. <laughs> so I'm about to ask you a slightly off-topic question. Yeah, and I'm gonna, about, I'm, I'm about to embarrass myself, and trust me, I did so many embarrassing things in my life, but, you know, there are a lot of rumors about SegWit on the network, and it appears that you know uh, quite a lot about SegWit, so here comes the question. Okay. Uh, to the best of your, of your knowledge, is there any patent actually covering SegWit or not? <laughs> Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no, uh, none at all, because um, you know SegWit uh, just uses new Bitcoin constructs essentially. So everything that SegWit uses was already in Bitcoin itself. So the question is, are there patents on Bitcoin? None, none that we know of, right? And Bitcoin was made to be very extensible. So you know you can add new software features and so on. So we have these special opcodes that we can repurpose. I think maybe some people thought there were patents because of like Schnorr, the signatures had a patent that expired in like 2008 or something like that. But that's not even included in the current version at all. So you're just looking at the system itself. It only includes basically the regular primitives of Bitcoin, you know, hash functions, signatures, has new commitment, you know, uses Merkle trees. Uh, so basically, just uses the existing components of Bitcoin in a more clever way. So I think you know any claim or patent are basically completely unfounded. And uh, if you actually do your research, you can see. Uh, I guess you can ask. No, it's like it, um, personally, I, I don't care that much about this topic, but there are a lot of people who actually care a lot about this topic. Sure. Things like. A, trend that you know that is going on like you know we shouldn't activate segwit because there are patents covering actually segwit and bullshit like that so i just want to you know uh nail it down and just say sure. yes or no uh basically no because you can ask satoshi right because segwit uses everything else in bitcoin originally it doesn't add anything new to bitcoin because it's a soft I know, I know. Right, no. anyway, it, it's a soft fork right if it was the case that a hard fork added maybe a new signature type or something like that, and that came you know, from outside of the system, then maybe that would be possible that, okay, the creator of this hard fork wanted this new capability and they had a patent on it and they could do damage, but Segwit basically uses everything that was already in Bitcoin okay. itself, and it uses it in pretty traditional ways. There's basically a new Merkle tree. You know, Merkle trees aren't patented. Um, you know, there's a new script type. It uses, uh, you know, uh, instead of, shot, instead of uh, RIPEMD, which is a 20-byte hash, it uses a 32-byte hash. That's not patented. Like, I so. think we could also add that every kind of attempt to patent something on top of Bitcoin, uh, since Bitcoin is MIT, would be, I mean, even if there was an attempt uh, to this kind of uh, uh, implementation, it would be invalid because uh, it would be using MIT stuff uh, yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. So, yeah. And like all major Bitcoin implementations basically use the MIT license, which is you know, very permissive, and everything is basically laid out you know, in full and that itself. So, because I was actually, I don't want to monopolize this, you know, question, whatever, <laughs> section, but whatever. So I was actually, I was actually, I was actually reading some stuff on the internet, like someone, you can ask the camera guy because he knows for sure who was this guy, who actually said that the SegWit, had some, actually some patents were actually covering SegWit, but those were just like defensive yeah, patents or shit like that or whatever, you know. Uh, that is fine. I mean, you actually say there are no patents. I actually trust you because you know way more than me about this segment and you actually explained it really well, so oh, cool. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, so, you know, we just recorded himself, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, there are a group of companies basically, you know, doing these defensive patents essentially, but um, they're pretty, uh, you know, legally binding essentially, that uh, even if the companies go under, they basically go, they go to some other cash and the companies, you know, if they fail, they could basically be sold on or or something like that. And you can basically go and look at the patents, uh, in the filings basically, ones that are in progress, ones that have been granted. You can go through these religiously and then see exactly what they were. So, you know, in the time where some people were basically, you know, claiming that there were patents, they basically just like had random things basically. It's like, you know, uh, transmitting data over the internet. It's like, are you gonna, are you gonna patent that? Like, you know, like, do digital signatures. Well, I mean, I can like write one down, I can do RSA on my, you know, piece of paper, like, so. Yeah. I can add something also on that because we as a blockchain lab BHP are working with uh, other Bitcoin experts on some POCs and prototypes and we have been asked by Peter Toll, by blockchain guys to actually try to use the uh, DPL model. The DPL model has these uh, objectives in mind. The thing is, if you just use MIT, so you're just free, open source, you cannot uh, use that for commercial reasons. Uh, if some uh, patent quarter company like, uh, I don't know, uh, Mike's or whatever they try to or uh, or R three sev they try to attack your pa uh, your implementation claiming their patent. Uh, if you are to if you want to oppose just an open source prior R to that, that's uh, uh, expensive for as a trial. You will uh, uh, the process to oppose a prior R is expensive. 
while a, pros a process to oppose a clear and registered patent is usually less expensive. So the DPL is an attempt to create a patent that is not in any way uh, possible to use in an aggressive way and that makes uh, stronger the defender. It's not re uh, still clear that this is superior to pure uh, open source. It's more expensive to, to register it, but maybe less expensive to defend it. Uh, right now, uh, we are discussing a lot uh, where to, 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 to use this. Uh, mm, some companies like Blossom, maybe Christian will tell something about that if he wants, uh, is uh, pledging to uh, apply that on any new implementation coming from the company. Bitcoin, can, Bitcoin or Segwit cannot be any of these because they are on top of MIT pre-existing work. So it's possible to use uh, that, that defensive patent, not still clear where we are going to use them, probably. Short sure answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so since I already introduced the, uh, another uh, member of the dark conspiracy, uh, maybe if you want to just say hi and yeah. we can do it. <laughs> I totally forgot that to say that Joanna and Andre from Lightning Labs are here with us uh, these days. So if you want to say hi, Joanna and Andre, hi. 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 Um, another important thing that I totally forgot is next meetup. That should be very interesting because uh, I'm planning to do something like Bitcoin against Ethereum. And it should be uh, probably the 10th or the 19th of July. Uh, I'm still working on that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's keep updated. Uh, if uh, you guys want to say something, I don't know if you uh, want to say two words about uh, Eclair. Uh, what's the difference? What are you working on? Uh. So hi everyone. So one of the questions we often have is uh, why different implementations of Lightning? Um, the difference between layer one and layer two is uh, in Bitcoin, the layer one is a consensus bait. So there, is, there are some reasons uh, that to there's some good reasons to only have one implementation of this uh, um, yeah. software because it would it may uh, lead to uh, consensus issues if some software have different rules. But on the protocol like uh, Lightning, having separate implementations uh, on the contrary, it uh, it uh, strengthens the network because we have uh, multiple uh, different implementations that wouldn't be vulnerable to the same kind of attacks, for example. It also brings other benefits, like making sure that if uh, several implementations um, derive from the same spe specification and uh, are implemented independently, it, uh, it gives a good um, amount of uh, certitude that the specifications is uh, clearly defined and doesn't have any uh, big issues. So thank you. the fact that we have uh, several um, a different implementation, it's actually a very good thing for Lightning, and uh, so we're very happy to be part of this effort with Blockstream and Lightning Apps. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's also good because, you know, on the specification, also the design itself, we have like a distinct set of eyes, so we basically have, you know, a very diverse set of reviewers on the profile itself. So rather than basically one person you know, creating it and basically saying you know, this is lightning, we have you know, a group of people that are all you know, looking at it, designing. You know, someone says, you know, are you sure that's what you mean? I'm like, oh, I don't really know about that. So we basically have you know, cross collaboration and it basically strengthens the protocol and makes it uh, you know, more scrutinous on their uh, higher level review. So. so now we have uh, some uh, quick uh, just uh, presentation, but uh, one minute uh, of uh, Chainside, which is a wallet that uh, somebody of you could know from the press. Because, uh, oh, first of all, thank you very much. Yay, of <laughs> So, Lalu, Lalu is not getting away. We are locking the doors, and he is uh, at your disposal for uh, at least 10 minutes after the meet of that, we will go to eat something. Uh, and, uh, and the same goes for, uh, for uh, Async and, and Blockstream. Uh, so, uh, Chainside is a word that is actually 
uh, enabling uh, the most uh, innovative, technologically speaking, innovative category in Italy, taxi drivers. You know, the, the, the real innovation comes from there. And they are, uh, they are enabling them to accept Bitcoin actually since, uh, since a while, and almost one year, and okay. Hello everyone, I'm Federico from Chessad. And yeah, we are a software company based in Rome. And we are developing, we, we already developed uh, like a wallet to uh, allow businesses to accept uh, Bitcoin. And we are developing a more powerful one that uh, is more fe flexible. So it supports a generic Bitcoin transaction, like anything you want with the uh, hash lock, time lock. Uh, so uh, it is flexible for multiple use cases. And we are doing this to uh, add like businesses with uh, like different needs. So maybe not just uh, accepting a normal Bitcoin transaction, but something more sophisticated and to, to, to facilitate it. So we are working on some very uh, generic uh, uh, wallet, uh, like a business oriented. So uh, right now we are uh, expanding the team. We are looking for uh, new developers. So if there is somebody in the audience interested in working on cool stuff on Bitcoin, uh, uh, come to us and we will be happy to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. So another startup from Rome, uh, in this case is Gabriele Marazzi that also organized uh, the last uh, blockchain meetup in which uh, Mir presented, still in my hospital, uh, my last book. And uh, Gabriele presenting SpeedChain. Thank you very much. I am very glad to can talk about what we are doing. And basically we want to bring something like uh, Bitcoin, so a way to have uh, a decentralized money but in the way of uh, in in uh, the shape of digital identity mainly we are working also with uh, Christopher Allen to rebuilding web of trust and hold the startup uh, mainly in the world that are working on this topic uh, try to find uh, um, a common way of uh, uh, address this uh, problem of decentralized digital identity and self sovereign digital identity and uh, we think we have an interest uh, we we have find an interesting uh, uh, way of uh, um, at least uh, talk about uh, the, um, the the part of the business because we think that we can address like a marketplace of digital identity where everyone owns his data everyone has uh, his digital identity in a way of uh, like PGP and uh, web of trust so everyone can just uh, trust the claim of uh, someone else just because he is uh, in his uh, uh, trust network no but then, if there are some uh, certifiers, someone that, for example, make a uh, know your customer uh, process or something like that, he can even sell this certification and uh, open uh, like a way of a decentralized marketplace of digital identity. And uh, for the moment, we just uh, have built uh, a part of a strong authentication that is uh, almost uh, a light wallet uh, when you can uh, claim your, your private key. And we are trying to develop also this part of the marketplace. Thank you very much again. So, another startup, not from Rome, but from Northeast. And they are going, if I had to bet about the first Italian startup actually uh, getting Lightning Network in production, it will be then in Bitcoin. Thank you. So, hello everybody, I'm Nicola from uh, In Bitcoin. As uh, Giacomo said, we are based uh, in Rovereto, in the northeast uh, part of Italy. And uh, we are mostly trying to bring Bitcoin, let's say, to the masses. That is to uh, take all the uh, hard knowledge, process it, and then give a proxy for trust to regular users. And we have an, an interesting case in Trentino, we're calling it Bitcoin Valley, as we have many active merchants accepting Bitcoin there and we are striving to get uh, the probably the first uh, real case scenario for lightning and our aim now is to get uh, segwit activated as soon as possible and then to provide a full chain of lightning network working from uh, the user wallet to uh, the merchants with payment systems and so in the content in the bottom line that's what we're trying to do and so there are three of us here, and uh, since doors are locked, we are not getting away either. So please reach for us if you want to talk with us, and thank you for being here. So, 
you are free, you can enter and drink uh, and eat again, and the guests just stay here for a photo opportunity, and uh, the meetup is free, go in peace. <laughs> Oh, at some point.